Hey everybody, Edo here, and I am excited tonight because I have T on the line. Say hello, T. Hello. <laughs> hello. Now, actually, you and I have known each other for a long time. You were one of the first media stars I was introduced to when I got into the industry with Liftoff Get Me Off This Planet, and at the time you had the One Tar channel and doing reviews and all that stuff, and I think, I mean, you basically like... Not only introduced me to a bunch of people, but you're like, I'll do this video, and I'm going to go on a roller coaster while I do it. And I was like, have fun with that. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was a super awesome video, and um, we ended up, like, I did a video on my channel. I did a video review that was on your channel, and then you did one on mine. But since then, um, you, you're not doing as much of the, the, the reviewer and media stuff. Um, but then you were working, you spent some time at Deep, Deep Water Games, right? Yep. Um, and now at Haba, you are the U.S. Games Channel, channel Manager, yeah. overseeing all of the U.S., right? Oh, well, and Canada. And uh, Canada. Yeah. And Canada, yeah. Well, well, and so just to start things off, we're actually going to talk about um, digital cons and the world we're in today and publisher events. But just quickly, in terms of what you're doing at Haba, can you just <laughs> outline it quickly for folks so they're just familiar? Yeah, um, so at Haba, I have a lot that I do. Um, Haba is a wooden German toy company, so they make, like, imagine, like, the most beautiful and quaint wooden building blocks that you can, and that's what Haba kind of, like, is most known for in Germany. Um, and they make, like, baby rattles and all these great baby toys out of, like, high-quality wooden German wood, right? Wood and German wood. Uh, but they also make games, and they've made games for quite a while, and most people in the game industry are just aware of the game line. Well, most people in the rest of the world are only aware of the toy line. <laughs> so, Which is super um, weird, right? Yeah, it's really, it's a flip for me, but, um, because I was only aware of the game line, and then when they hired me, they, they sent me a catalog, and I was like, what, what is, is all is this other this? stuff? <laughs> and would you say just for people, is Rhino Hero the, like, most known or am i off no well so in the u.s rhino hero is maybe the most known i mean yeah, in the u.s sure. is what i'm talking about yeah yeah so animal upon animal and rhino hero i think are like the most known and then the next most known would be my very first game's first orchard okay, which is sure. a great game for two and up and it has like this like huge wooden apples and pears and stuff and it's really great for fine motor skills and teaching colors and things so, yeah, but in the U.S. with the game stuff, what I do is I'm head of basically the games for the U.S. Uh, division. So I'm in charge of uh, what gets imported from Germany into the U.S. I make that decision. I also am in charge of the English translations and proofing for all of the games, um, regardless if they come to the U.S. or not. I'm also in charge of planning and running and coordinating all of the U.S. and Canadian-based events that Hoppe participates in. So, like, Origins, Gen Con... Uh, trade shows like Gamma, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm also in charge of the game's marketing strategy and um, like import schedule, release schedule, like just all of that stuff is kind of what I'm in charge of. I don't do it all by myself, thank goodness. Uh, we have a whole team of people and in the toy part that I just lean on for the game part as well. So I like set the schedule and then the warehouse people, you know, help roll it out according to the schedule I set, so... Yeah. Oh, it's, it's super, super awesome. And uh, having, at the time, you first introduced me to Haba, mm -hmm. um, I had, my kids were a lot younger. And there's like a whole bunch, I mean, there's the egg game, I don't remember the name of it, but there's like a whole bunch of, of, of fun, wacky stuff. Uh, and it's all bright and colorful and accessible. Um, I also love Serendipity. So if you don't mind, because we were talking about it, can you tell the origin story of just how you first got into a met uh the haba lady yes well yeah and so haba like i mentioned haba is mostly known on the international scale for its baby toys and in the u.s previously that's what i was most well known for and so they hadn't really thought the u.s division hadn't really thought to bring over the games and finally enough people had like emailed haba saying hey bring over these games from germany that they were like uh we'll try it so the president of Haba USA, um, my boss, Leah, was like, yeah, okay, we'll try it. So she looked up like a game show to go to and she went to Origins and she'd never been to a consumer game show ever. Um, and so she ordered, she like did everything the way that she normally would for a, like a retail trade show. 
which is very different from how you do a consumer show. Um, And so she rolled in and it was set up day and she didn't really know what she was doing. And I was there vlogging for my YouTube channel like I used to do. And I see this very nicely dressed woman. I think she was wearing like heels even um, in like a business suit with like two pallets still shrink wrapped standing in a booth just looking at the pallets just kind of like what do I do? (laughs) So I was like oh okay. So I threw down my backpack and I helped her set up her booth. And she thanked me profusely and took me to dinner. And then from that point on, we were friends. Uh, And so whenever she had questions about like, hey, what does it mean that this person wants me to do this thing for their YouTube channel? I was like, ah, this means this. Um, And so after like six years of that, um, she finally was like, hey, we're opening a position for a games channel manager. You should apply for it you're going to have to like go through the process and we're going to take other candidates, but like still you should apply. Um, and so I did. And then three months later I got the job, which was super awesome. But yeah, for sure. Yeah. So but, you never know what you'll get from helping somebody set up their booth. Well, it, it's true. <laughs> it, look, it's true. And that's why I love the story because you know, a lot of folks, especially in the board game industry are just it, always about breaking in. How can they get involved? What can they do? And really that going to conventions, be part of a community associating it's such a, a flat playing field in a certain in a certain regard that there's just all these opportunities that come out of i mean again i remember interviewing paul peterson and he was like yeah i was like the guy who answered all the questions on their qa forum uh, you know like list server or whatever it was and then they like invited me to answer all the questions for them and like it moves that way so there's a lot i mean obviously you um, were doing uh marketing and u.s stuff for deep water games and have built a skill set and all that stuff, but still, it's it's good to know that those relationships stick. But to get to the topic, so uh, T, we were talking about um, conventions and digital conventions, and um, you know, over the last, you know, the, it's almost the last year, right? Like over the last ten months, as everyone's been in inside, right? There have been many conventions that have tried to do this online con thing right um you know well origins didn't really happen but there was gen con and um but then there's been all the bgd stuff and pax right and a number of other ones and they've all sort of had different vibes Mm -hmm. but and there have been some smaller ones that were handled by sort of youtubers and other things that like sort of game weekends but they 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 feel like they've to one degree or another fallen a little flat or have, I mean, it's hard. I don't know if there are true expectations, right? Because it's this new thing that no one was really ready to do. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, how, how have you seen the performance? Are there any that, that sort of st- stick out to as being really good or. I think that there's definitely been ones that have done really well. And then there's ones that have not, and it's definitely a perspective thing, right? Like who are you asking? Um, are you asking me as an attendee? Are you asking me as a publisher? Because the answer is like different for every convention. Um, I think the best one that we've had, I've done six virtual cons now as a publisher. Um, and the best one that we had as a publisher and that I felt was the best for attendees was Gen Con Online. They really pivoted really early in the year. Um, and and they have the like team and the workforce because they have people who are full time Gen Con employees oh, that sure. spend all year planning normal Gen Con and so they were able to pivot and like use it. It wasn't like a group of people that were doing this as like a part time job kind of thing. Right. Um, so at Gen Con they use their event system that they already use. They already understood the significant like server like weight that will be put on their systems because if you've ever tried to get a hotel at Gen Con, you you know. Sure. <laughs> like Um, so they understood like, okay, if we're going to direct everybody from that normally attends our convention to a digital portal, we're going to need some good servers. So they did a really good job with that. I think they understood setting up the exhibitors and making sure exhibitors were prepared and, and knew what to do. They made sure that attendees were set up and knew what to do for like three weeks before Gen Con even happened, they had streams happening daily where they had people talking about any subject about what was going to happen at Gen Con. So that like, I remember rolling in as an exhibitor every other day because they would do exhibitor focused Twitch streams. And I could just sit there and be like, Derek, how do I do this thing in the system? And Derek would on stream, like live on Twitch, just like do a screen share and be like, okay, this is where you're going to go. So 
they did a great job from a publisher standpoint. Our sales were actually really good. We were surprised. Um, so that was, that was really good. We did good as in regards to like sales expectations were met engagement with customers was really good. Um, and I felt that attendees felt like they could still play and engage with each other. And there were some really awesome events. Like there were still like yoga and arts and crafts. Like they did a really good job. Um, that one I really like. The other ones I'm kind of like, ah. um, the very first virtual con that BGG did that focused literally just on play was really great from a let's just play standpoint. Right. But from a publisher trying to sell units, it was like, because ah. people, when you go to BGG con, people don't really buy things at BGG con. Right. And sure. it translated to their virtual experience. Yeah, the emphasis there is really very different, right? Especially, I mean, I'm sure games that were sort of the hotness probably, you know, continue to get play, right? But uh, Yeah, yeah. And so it's like, from that perspective, that convention did achieve what its goal was. But as a publisher, was it worth it for us to attend? Not really. Like, but I would say that about most BGGs, not to be really whatever. But like, as a publisher, when I go to a BGG, I'm not doing it for sales or like exposure to my games. I'm going to have meetings with other people in the industry and also so I can play the hotness. Right. You know, for sure. So, yeah. and so, and, and, and then when you, from the publisher, and I think actually the different perspectives, because there's the content creators, the players, the organizers, um, and then, and then the publishers and probably a few more, I didn't say, but you know, from a publishing perspective, like the different things that these conventions have sort of brought to the table are, and throw any, I'm missing here, but like demos, Mm-hmm. open play and this is using whatever sort of simulator or whatever you want to use demos mm-hmm. open plays like sort of announcements and q a meet and greet type things right are there are there any other categories i mean i would throw panelists into sure. the like q a like there's panels at a, at a lot of shows as well in some shape or form right right um also organized plays and there's open play and then there's like tournaments sure 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 people really like to do the tournaments was there a I, not not that I participated at all, but was there like some sort of Catan tournament at Gen Con? Because that's like there, there's always a big thing. They did a virtual Catan tournament. Um, the bigger one was actually the pandemic. So um, Asmodee? Asmodee did, it's the same company technically, but Asmodee did the pandemic world tournament for Spiel bigger than they did the Catan uh Gen Con tournament, but the the Catan tournament did still happen. Well, and I so I don't think it was normally. It's normally like huge. I don't think they pushed it as hard. Sure, as sure. Did. I mean, it's it, it's like it's the national tournament. Um, and then so did you do? Were you, did you participate at Spiel one that that was? I mean, that was only what a weekend, two weekends ago. Yeah, that was a that was a weekend <coughs> ago. Yeah. That was a week ago. Week ago. Um, a little more yes we participated we participated hard at spiel we had two tracks um and because spiel is primarily based in germany but it could be worldwide this year and haba is technically a worldwide company we actually had six habas participating we had a server and a twitch channel with seven languages supported um and we had 78 hours of streaming for like the whole weekend we had one night where we did nonstop from Friday at 9 a.m. German time until um, 9 p.m. Uh, West Coast time on Saturday. We had continual content um, for Spiel on and, Haba. And then, I mean, it looks like it was this really pu- big push for Spiel. Did you feel, because, I mean, you, you said Gen Con had worked out the best. Did you feel that... Mm-hmm. Spiel worked out okay for the effort. Was it? Did it not? It, no. Well, I, I mean, because from my perspective, it's been okay. I think part of it is as a player, as a consumer, I have a hard time engaging with conventions, uh, yeah. digital online conventions, just because like it's a little amorphous. Like I have to go through this UI to get to the thing that where like I could just play with folks if I wanted to. Um, and so I haven't found, found myself super like, boy, I'm looking forward to the next online convention. Like, and so, so in turn as a publisher, 
you know, we've we've done a stream here, did a thing there, but it wasn't like, oh, let's either pay for the uh, the you know whatever the fee was or get him get like it just it hasn't grabbed me one way or yeah. the other. Um, so I don't exactly have that perspective of of really getting into it. But what do you think? Why was Gen Con more successful than Spiel? Like, what were the dynamics? What were the differences? I think there was a big difference was in timing. So Gen Con happened in the summer where a lot of people, their families were already like kids were not in school. Um, the lockdown and the pandemic situation was, it still seemed like it could end soon. If that makes sense. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, Cause Gen Con Just... was early August right, right. and people are like, this is going to be the end and it's summer. And like a lot of people will do family vacations for Gen Con or they do vacations around that time period. And so I think we had a lot of people that said they took off work thursday friday to attend this virtual gen con and we had a lot of people that came through the booth that were excited because they had never made it to a gen con before sure so this was like a great way for them to experience that but then you fast forward even just two months or two and a half months and people are just like over it they they don't want to spend they already spend so much time staring at their computer for literally everything and then their kids are now engaged with the computer for literally everything because school has started, right. right? And they just they don't want to sit at a computer and do virtual game cons. It doesn't. I think that's a big part of it. I mean, um, screen screen fatigue is a huge deal, right? I mean, it's yeah. a, at the at the very local family level for me, but um, but also, you know, it's just very. It's it's part of the pleasure of of board games, and I think. I don't know if it's the novelty. I know a lot of folks are really excited and engaged, but at some point, you know, again, it, it feels, um, especially when you're thinking about a long con, like a four day, like that's just a lot, of, a lot of time to be screen, screen, screen watching. Yeah. Well, and, and a lot of people, like I got into board gaming because at the time when I got into gaming, my job was computer science. And so I was staring at a computer constantly and it, it like, all the time and so I got into board gaming because it was something that I could do with my friends that had literally nothing to do with a screen so I had other friends that really liked video gaming I just video gaming never like staring at a screen for fun never appealed to me Sure. and sure. now in 2020 we're sitting here going yeah you want to play the latest game log on to Tabletopia and I'm just like ah, how about not <laughs> like, yeah. how about I just wait six months and play it in, in person with someone yeah for um, sure and, I, and, and, and yeah and it's just it's a lesser experience. I mean, there's certain things that are easiest, easier, but especially, and I don't want to, I mean, Tabletop Simulator, Tabletopia are doing amazing things and giving a lot of access, but, you know, the one-size-fits-all solution for gaming just makes all the mechanics of the game not feel great. Whereas, like, if you just do an app that was like, this is the Small World 2 app, everything's, like, streamlined, and then you're, like, get this, like, fast experience. Whereas, I think, you know, it's it, they're still clunky on, on different games. Yeah. But... And so, but so, what's interesting is the overlap again um, was from Pencil First Games' perspective. I, you know, you know, we're thinking about how to engage with fans and what we can do and participate. But like, there's been this like, boy, I feel like these cons are a mess. And we we were talking. I was talking with AMJ, who's who does the our social media and uh, our new sales manager Jessica about it. And it was like, well, what if we did more of a like a fan appreciation sort of pencil first games thing. And, you know, you just let people know, Hey, on Saturday or this day, it's, it's still virtual, right? Like it's not, not virtual, but like, Hey, we're going to do stuff, but it's really just going to be about pencil first games. And we have as much ability to tell you about it as Gen Con has the ability to tell you about it. And, you know, it'll be chill and it's not going to be, you know, and so I think at the same time we were in that discussion, you had also uh, posted on, on Twitter, sort of a a similar question. I, I like, what would make a Haba game day cool? Or I don't remember your exact question, but it was sort of a reach out to like, what would you want? What would yeah. you think about? Yeah. Well, and cause the thing with the spiel and the Gen Con as well is like you had spiel had like 400 something publishers. So even though you're online, like in normal spiel, it's, it's really easy to miss things, but like you're still walking around, but like with a digital experience, you have so many people vying for your attention digitally 
it's and it, you have to click to see things it's really easy to get overwhelmed and just completely miss really awesome stuff that normally you would just like see when you like walked by sure, you'd be sure. like oh what's this like tiny whatever booth so i feel like doing an event that it's just like pencil first games or just like a hobby specific event or an event with just like a small small number of publishers it's a lot easier to help give a, a more tailored experience and focus and at the same time like there's not as much i don't know ad fatigue like they're not getting bombarded with with here's 400 publishers check out what they have like that's just too much do you know what i mean yeah for sure and and i think it, it, there's also a, again intimacy isn't the right word but there, there's a little bit more of a direct connection when i think you're sort of engaging with in some ways it's a little less about you know when you're like um, Gen Con traditional is an opportunity to wade with this huge audience of folks who probably, especially for Pencil First Games, but who, who may not know the product lines, may not know your games. They're a, a bunch of, you know, like 98% affinity folks that may have never seen your stuff. Um, whereas I think if you're going to do like a, a Hobbit Day or a Pencil First Games or whatever, um, it's a little bit more of a um, more of a relationship building with your fans. It's more of a fan day. Like it's less it's less of put out a net and capture unknowns. It's more about reengaging the people who already like your stuff or was on a Kickstarter. I mean, that's how I'm thinking about it, right? It's more like, yeah. hey, we can all spend a Saturday together if you want, and if you don't, you know, I'll just be on my computer screen. But it's cool. Um, but you know, and asking Keith um, Matega of Thunderworks if who did dis- design Skull Callow, hey, could you do a play test and Steve Finn and other folks who'd, you know, like, Hey, let's get the band together for like an yeah. afternoon. It, that's the idea. What, what I kind of that, feedback did you get from folks when you reached out? For our thing, the biggest thing that we got, and we're in a little bit of a different market than you. Sure. Uh, we definitely have an overlap, but we're, you know, Venn diagram circles of audience. Um, we're still pretty separated. Uh, for Haba, the feedback that we got from our customers, um, the like small fan base that you know follows me on Twitter, was that the basically they're just burnt out on screen time. Like they're 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 struggling because their kids are on. A lot of them have kids that are doing the distance learning or Zoom call learning, and so to let their kids participate or do anything that involves a screen time is just really hard for them. But at the same time if the screen time is more engaging and fun in a way that isn't just passive. So the idea of doing play alongs, we do sure, play alongs sure. of Color It and Karuba and Fiber Find In. So doing family friendly play alongs where we actually engage with you and they get to do something physically that, that works is, is more engaging for our audience, especially because our audience, the majority of our games target um, young kids and families with young kids. And so saying, Hey, bring your five year old and we'll play cloak cats on Tabletopia. That doesn't really work. <laughs> like No, for um, sure. I mean I the 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 type there have been some really great sort of learn how to draw, participate, um engagement type fun where it's not even the person, the child or the person isn't like on their isn't on the PC. It's more like it's more like a tell you know, teleconference where somebody's just, you know, saying you know, let's let's play Red Rover at Red Rover, and like everyone's running around, right? Like the, it, you know, the kids when they have gym, it's they're they're doing a lot of, of interesting things where it'll be like, go find something, like run around your house until you find something blue, and then come back and show it, and then find something red, and that, you know, and it's like they're trying to get them to run around and and be kids, then they're just providing the seeds. Yeah. Um, have you thought about any, I mean, you could imagine creating printable materials or things like that to sort of have somebody have something in front of them. Yeah, we actually do have on the Hobby USA website, if you go under, I think it's like the About Us or the Learn More, there's actually an activities and printable section. Um, and so we actually have coloring sheets that you can download and color. We have like word scrabbles. We have like a scavenger hunt around your house. And then we have another one that's like outside really easy stuff like find a stick that's this big or things like that um and we put those into effect we did those early in the lockdown in like april and then another thing that we have is we do have the print and play files 
for the games that you can play over Zoom or Facebook or just play along with like YouTube videos, we have all of those files available for download. So if a family owns a copy of Color It and they maybe want to play it with grandma or something like that, they can call and do a video call and then, you know, just say, oh, grandma, we rolled a two and a three and green and blue, right? And then grandma can print out and color their own sheet and that kind of thing. So we do have those materials. And for Spiel, the stream programming that we had, we had a Discord server where we had like Tabletopia demos of our older family games, um, like Miyabi and Honga. Um, And then we had the streams and the stream content was definitely more family friendly programming. And we had five play alongs a day. Um, where you could play Karuba either, I forget, Karuba like twice a day, Fiber Find In was once a day, and then Color It we had three times a day in multiple different languages. And those were our most popular streams, for sure. And so, reflect, and just for, since you had mentioned there were a few others, we don't have to like do play by plays on all of them, but yeah, yeah. what other ones did you participate in? You like mentioned you know, six, six or seven of them? Six, yeah. <laughs> so, the first one was Virtual Gaming Con. Um, which was the, that was like, oh man, it was May, I want to say. Um, and then there was, uh, Gen Con Online, and then there was UK Games Expo, and then there was Aw Shucks, and then there was right. Spiel, and then maybe I'm counting Origins because we didn't do it, but we planned for it. We were ready to, to like launch it. I think I'm counting Origins in that six. Yeah, and that one was weird in that I had actually, um, uh, Blue Orange Games is, they're based in the Bay Area, and I've been in contact with them here and there, and they actually, I, I don't know what's going on, but they used to have a guy, they don't have a guy anymore, and uh, they were basically like, we're going to do this virtual booth, but we don't have, can you do the game intros for this virtual booth? So it was like, hey, welcome to the virtual booth, blah, 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 um, which never, I mean, maybe they used it somewhere else, but it didn't get used yeah. for that. Um, and and so it was interesting. Why did I think maybe I was thinking about Aw Shucks as packs? Was there a packs one or am I crazy? There was a pack. Okay, okay. Yes, but the prices to do packs as a board game company were outrageous. Right. And then we also decided trying to compete as a board game company against like actual video game companies for a virtual con would be the stupidest decision sure. ever. No. All right. So okay, but so so you've been to those and engaged with those, and, and obviously there've been a few other ones, but you know. What so we talked about? Hey, what are some ideas about trying to do it as a publisher or as a little small group of publishers? But if you were just like, if we're still doing this next year, and all these cons are still virtual, like mm-hmm. what are the things that you would want to see to like make a difference as a publisher? Like what? Like if you could say do these three things and it'd just be a little bit better. Like what do you think that would be? I think the biggest thing that I would want to do is I would want to make it where retailers, local community members and retailers could also help participate. So what I would really like is I would like it where we basically make, you know, my dream would be like we make a kit and we sell it to the retailers and then the people wanting to participate in the convention go to the retailer and they buy the kit and they take it home and then when the convention starts, they open it and it has the new hotness or it has like a shirt or a lanyard or like it gives some sort of that physical connected like feeling that you that you get when you go to a physical show and part of that is by purchasing physical items and having them right then and there but the other thing is like you could have um I was thinking like we could do postcards and they're pre-stamped postcards and it's like they're maybe pre-addressed to somebody or something and like you can write postcards and say like hey this is from Illinois and like so you that people can actually connect in a way that you would at a convention um also maybe like having like a secret digital someplace that you can only gain access to if you get the code from the box like sure 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 kind of thing and so that would involve a lot a lot of the physical a lot of the digital conventions that were implemented this year were implemented as a oh crud i guess we're going digital and so if we had the ability and the foresight to know okay gen con is going to be digital in august 
then we could start planning right now for that so that we could make sure that something like that box was available in time and people could pre-order it or even we just ship it direct to their house or you know what i mean like something like that yeah i know earlier it's 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 very i mean it's a very interesting idea and a lot of it is right like the cons in many ways are just trying to replicate the cons right like they're trying to create those events and 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 sort of re-manifest it to the best of everyone's ability and boy hard work right no no doubt that it's hard work but there is something interesting which would be more i mean it's probably just ends up being a different type of event but more of where people sign up they get that kit the kit comes with the games and perhaps it's less about it's less about shared you know concurrent digital time and more about you know asymmetric play right like hey everyone we're gonna have it play your games and we're gonna have a, a really cool way to log each game you play and who won in your scores and we're gonna have like a cool score chart digital score viz of like the kpis of the con and who's playing and we have this game and that game but it's much more play at a local retailer you know because i'm sh- i suspect even if the con is cons are in person next year they are not going to be the sea yeah. of people in you know it it so it could po- quite possibly be a situation where getting together 20 30 people in a retail location is like sort of okay and it's like the hundred thousand yeah. people in one location is more like the, like probably not a good idea um, yeah <laughs> so so i guess like i think that idea of saying like how how can this play experience still be a physical experience but then use the internet to have that connectivity that tissue and that sort of sense of everyone doing something groups of people all doing things at the same time um you know i think it's an interesting uh, approach Um, you'd have to have it in advance though but yeah well and that's the biggest thing is that it would have to be an advanced thing if we i mean i'm pretty sure that if we got some smart people together um that were interested in creating something like this and had the experience um of running a Kickstarter and doing some sort of planning on this, we could come up with like a convention in a box Kickstarter thing, right? Where sure. it's like, you know, you pre-order it. We use Kickstarter as the platform just as like the pre-order system. Right. But it's like the thing that's delivered is this kit and it has the things in it. And it's, we have all these events that happen and, and you do have that system that you're talking about. The other option is, is like if there's games that make sense to be played remotely together like you have a copy i have a copy and we just play sure together like there are games that exist that can be played like that um i mean have this medium. just to riff so. for a second because that's as fun as anything these days but like there's all sorts of cool things you can imagine out of that because like in some ways you're sort of saying like what if you uh did an escape room product but actually it was like connected through the the like everyone was interconnected right um, because then you could have clues that you don't have the answer to, right? But somebody else yeah. does, so you have to reach out and, and do it, right? Um, but also, you could have fun things like you have games where it is a, a Zoom-based game, but again, there's only, you know, only some people have the components to run the games, and the other people have the, you know, the components to play. Um, there's all sorts of fun and interesting things you could do, I'm just yeah. saying. But um, it'd be interesting. Yeah, because it's one of those things where, like, with for me and for several of my friends who go to conventions just to attend them, the biggest thing was going to a convention and being with people that aren't your everyday life. Like it's, sure. a, it's like an escapism <laughs> thing. And so to like figure out a way to provide that in more than just a log into your computer and kind of zone out the rest of the world for a little while, I think is, is is key and having things where like you are forced or maybe not forced but you're encouraged to engage with people in a way beyond just clicking buttons or typing on a keyboard i think is really interesting i think that's where conventions become fun for me and for a lot of my friends that would go to conventions is the idea of like hey let's play a game together or i like my favorite thing to do at spiel was always to play games with people that didn't speak english like i absolutely loved sitting down to play a game and like i would have the english rule book and they would have whatever language they had and then we would sit there and figure out how to play this steffenfeld game and then we would play it and it would play beautifully and like we would speak literally nothing the entire game (laughs) right so trying to figure out a way to have those kind of engagements that doesn't 
because when you put this screen between us, you block that. Like one of the problems that we had with Spiel demos was the way that Spiel had the booth system work. We had no idea how many people were standing there at the edge of the booth, like going, do I play a demo? But when you have a real life con, when you see people standing at the edge of your booth, you know, you lure them in, you say, come play. Oh, do you want to play? Right. So we could have had 300 people standing at the edge of the booth looking at our new release, but we didn't know. Right. right. And in, a, in a physical convention, those people that are standing there looking at the thing, they see each other. Right. right. And so maybe they'll be like, oh, do you want to play? Let's go. There's two seats. Let's go do this. Right. So how do you kind of. Yeah. It's a, that? Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, when you were talking it, a couple things, one um, reminded me of the stuff that Eric Zimmerman uh, and Game Lab did at G, GDC, which yeah. is a game developers conference. But what they would do is they had all these social events that were like you know it like gig not werewolf but like this is a game where everyone is a different you know a different fantasy role and you have a voting card and like if you sign up you get this little packet you keep in your pocket and now when you're doing everything else you can like kill some you know you can use your little card to play you know rock paper scissor and see who's the win and they have like a scoreboard and they they it like got more and more exa- extravagant each each time but like those sort of meta games that you're playing at these at these cons but the other thing um you know that like i was thinking about when you were um uh, now i just lost it why did i just lose it oh like one version is to say hey you know the answer is h uh 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 HMDs and like uh, head mounted displays and it's all about like hey if everyone just had a quest or a quest 2 and like then you'd be able to see everyone walking around and it would be like and then like it, it totally feels like the total wrong direction right mm-hmm. um, it's like one of the few pieces of technology like I've refused from having in the house it's like no you're bad enough when you're on your screen I don't need you in a box but um, I feel like that what you're describing like one of the things I was going to ask you about was like hey do you think a part of one thing that these cons need to do is like f- improve their shopping experience for, for 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 people but also that like what you were saying is that sense of traffic right like how can you give a sense of oh there are people here who are interested in this and like this is a spot where there's this engagement this clustering all that stuff which you see in in real life you can't sort of see cuz you're right like maybe at any given time you know if we were scrolling the page and seeing where people were, there was 20 people with Haba dead center at it, you know, yeah. and they just nah, didn't want to click, nah, you know, didn't want to. And so how do you create that engagement? I, I, I don't know if there's a really good answer to that. The, yeah. And Spiel tried a thing where when people were on a publisher's booth, the more people that were her, currently had the exhibitor page open, the planet, the like link to it would glow. The problem was, is that, even when you were in the booth, there was no sense of like feeling for anyone else was there. So the planet would glow and you'd be like, oh, there's a lot of people there. And so then you'd click on it and then you would just be loaded with a web page that had literally no sign of life. Like there's no chat that's live rolling on the side. There's no, like it's, so it's, you know, 20 people, 30 people, 400 people, we don't know, looking at the same web page, but there's nothing to do on that web page together. Like right. you have to go elsewhere to do it, and that's where it kind of like went, blah, blah, blah. like it just. Blah. Yeah, and it's hard to it's hard to th- like, hey, there are great examples from Club Penguin to Among Us of games that show a variety of people to like together in a space interacting, and but like at that point you're like sort of making a video game, right? Like it's sort of like yeah. where's where where is it still yeah. board games at that point? Yeah, so um, it's like how do we how do we get the analog experience of a board game convention into a digital realm without yeah. making it into a video game conference experience like, yeah right like how do we have fun with people online uh, if only there was a hundred solutions but no i think I, I it does seem like and and again if you're just doing it as a single publisher you can come up with your own ideas but if there was a way you know if one of these conventions took on hey we want to do a kit i mean it's expensive you have to ship but at the same time you know you get to that thing it's like well hey y- you know if you're willing to put in a product if you're willing to give us a thousand two thousand of your product to ship to all these people we'll cover the shipping cost in their you know membership not uh, you know whatever yeah, price yeah, of yeah, admission the cost of the, yeah 
because you know stuff like that happens i mean whenever um you know for a gamma typically you know they're like the retailer boxes that go around. it's not like the idea of publishers putting stuff into a thing that gets given yeah um but it yeah it would be interesting yeah, well, and it gets it turns into that whole like, well, of course we just sell the space in the box, and then it but then it becomes like people are sending stuff you don't want, or they're sending yeah, stuff yeah. that like majority of people are going to throw away. Yeah, it so really it, it would really need a game master, right? It really yeah. needs somebody who was like, no, 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 we're crafting an experience. The number mm-hmm. one objective here is that when somebody the con ends, they feel like. They had this incredible experience with a variety of games and they had their legacy boxes and they didn't open the last box until the last hour and then they were in that raffle and then they won the car or whatever. Like, <laughs> um, But anyway, so are you – so was the takeaway – because, you know, uh, it's about time to sort of wrap up the, the, the chat mm-hmm. though. I, I could keep chatting. Did, did you net that you are going to try to do something with Haba this year? Or are you sort of where, – where did you land? Still up in the air? It's still up in the air. One thing that we definitely confirmed we want to do is we do want to figure out something. Um, Right now, the something is loosely going to be reoccurring play-along streams, but that's like the bare minimum of the something that we want to do. We do want to figure out, because for 2020, the mission that I had that I put down in 2019 was that we were going to grow... um, family safe gaming spaces inclusive family safe gaming spaces for people and so we were going to do we were sponsoring and and making game safe spaces at a lot of conventions we were partnering with origins gen con pax um to make areas where people could bring like a toddler yeah and like they could just like it was a fenced zone with a volunteer guarding the door basically and so like you could go in let your toddlers out of the strollers and like feel comfortable and we wanted to have that experience like you could sit in game and all this other stuff there too so we were trying to figure out now that 2020 is definitely almost over with this new reality and like what does next year look like how can we help families feel like they they have a safe engaging um, game space right now and right now that's that's how do we do that in their homes right so that's the thing that we're trying to figure out and and if it means that we're making a haba package and we're sending it and it's like this family sits down and gets to have an experience it's cool but like i mean if i could if i could i would send every family like a pre-cooked meal like you know like just open the box and it's delivery it's a board <laughs> game look rodney smith's gonna teach you to play like, <laughs> the box flips out of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like Rodney just like in a pop up, um, in a in yeah. a in a uh, a small sweatshirt would be just like <laughs> not able to yeah. move his arms. A small Hava sweatshirt, it would be how yellow. Um, like that would be the dream, right? That's that's what I would do. Is every family that just needs a, just needs a game day or a game night or like to feel comfortable to do that. I would. I wish I could do that for them. And so the question is, how do I make that happen? Right, and then the logistics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting. I definitely think we're gonna do we're gonna sh- try to do this, whatever the branding gets turns out to be. This like P you know PFG day, um, yeah. and you know, and I was just you know I, I, I pulling together a game that gets shipped out of the wind. But I, I was thinking about things like hey, you know, like you know, it's hard if you're not it's harder when you're not in the United States. But it's like anyone who comes who lives in the United States will send you a a pin or a little card pack or a little this that like is like costs a stamp like that i could probably like i don't think we have that much fans that i couldn't do the stamp on each one um it's just the the two days to label them all but something to sort of bring that together maybe or maybe it's sort of like there might be a version that's a little bit more scavengery right like hey we can't and we're not going to send you these things but go get a black pen go get a this go get a piece of paper and you need a scissor and you're not going to know what you're going to do with it you're just going to put in a box and then show up and come for a surprise um or we'll just do q and a's and just do a virtual con for just you know <laughs> that's that might be where it ends um but anyway i mean i've always i've always said you need beth sobel art postcards just yeah, like true. pick Pick any pick any of your games where anyone has done any art. You are always fantastic in your artist yeah. uh, recruitment, and then just like shuffle them all up, and then make a stack of postcards. Wow. And just well, yeah, we yeah, uh, but that I mean, 
No, and and for what it's worth, Sunset Over Water still comes with a, a postcard in it. But no, I, I mean, I was very close. I, I sort of regret, I mean, I don't regret it, but like, I was really close to pulling the trigger on um, uh, puzzles, uh, art puzzles. And, I, you know, at the time, I was like, I don't know if I'm, I don't want to like be in the puzzle business. I don't know if I'm going to get in this store. But hey, if I was sitting on 5,000 puzzles right now, they'd be sold. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Especially in March. Holy smokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, and that's really funny. So how about we have published puzzles. Like, pu- puzzles exist in uh, Germany, and we never brought them over. And in, in, like, February, we were like, let's just try. Let's just bring over some puzzles. And then lockdown happened, and the container showed up, like, the next day. And we were like, yes! <laughs> no, puzzles are where it's at. Anyway. T, thanks so much for being on. It'll certainly be interesting to see the different things that happen. And if uh, you do start saying like, hey, what if we did this Kickstarter-y thing and we did... Let me know. I, I, I did Kickstarter. <laughs> I did weird, wacky stuff. Um, I, mean, I would definitely support it in every way that I could, but I never want to run a Kickstarter ever again. <laughs> like, yes, I'm it's fair. I'm good. <laughs> it's fair. Well, and then, you know, yeah. It's a cool platform, though. Or could you, hey, maybe you could do a game found platform, you know, that, you know, and, and try it. But anyway. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for being on. And thanks everyone for watching. See you online, I guess. Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. Edo here. And thanks for watching Gaming with Edo. Reviews over here on this playlist. League and insider videos over here on this one. Subscribe. Share. All that good stuff, but most importantly, play some great games. Thanks.